I'm presenting this from my computer today because um, something happened in the world of machine learning this morning that I wanted to present to you. So um, my previously created talk was slightly out of date by the time I got on the plane. So we're going to do it a little bit on the fly, if that's OK. Um, but let's start with you know what people have been um, kind of imagining uh, from what our computers could do. I don't know if you guys remember this. I think it was from 2011. Uh, Google had this uh, uh, April Fool's joke, where it was the Google uh, Gmail autopilot, uh, which says, um, you know, there's a few warnings, for example, that if you and the re recipient both have autopilot turned on, then after three conversations, uh, further messages may commit you to dinner parties or baby namings in which you have no interest. So some of the possible dangers of, uh, of what might happen. Um, people have been imagining what uh, kind of automation could happen for a while. Some of you might remember Douglas Adams in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, he needed everybody in his universe to be able to talk to each other. He couldn't even conceive of a computer could, that could do that, so instead he invented the Babelfish a device, a, a, a creature so incredibly unlikely that it uh, was in fact the proof of the existence of God. Um, uh, and even Alan Turing, um, who in some ways was the inventor of the modern computer, uh, imagined that uh, computers could one day do, could do art or do music. Um, for example, uh, he imagined that maybe like this artist, you could start with a, a photo and you could start with a, a style and maybe a, a, a really great artist could do something like this and create a, 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 a beautiful new work um, in, <clears throat> in the style of something that's come before. Um, uh, well, um, it's interesting where the world has come um, because, in fact, this work uh, was created by a computer. Um, those of you who might have come across this uh, uh, technology called artistic style is in fact a technology which uh, does create new paintings from scratch, such as this one. Uh, in fact, everything I've just told you about now exists. Um, Google's uh, April Fool's joke is now a real product. Uh, last week they announced that you can now uh, automatically create replies to emails. Uh, and here's an actual example. Um, so here was an email that came in, and here were the suggestions which uh, the uh, Google auto reply um, automatically suggested. Uh, and indeed, uh, translation. Um, if you go to the, Google, uh, the Skype translator preview, uh, you can now download something that in real time will translate your spoken English to German, uh, French, Italian, Mandarin, Spanish uh, in real time. Voice-to-voice uh, -voice translation. So something amazing has happened, which has caused uh, an April full stroke from just four years ago to be something that's actually a real technology today. Something that a science fiction writer could not imagine a computer doing, so had to invent a whole new uh, organism, um, now exists. Um, I think it's interesting, sometimes at Singularity University we look far off into the future, but I really wanted to say, well, what do we have right now? And maybe even look at the very, very recent past. Um, just for fun, here are some more examples of actual computer artwork um, uh, and the underlying inspirations that the computer was given. Some of them are actually quite extraordinary. Like, if you look at this one here, um, this, this, these have all been created. This, uh, if you go to this website, uh, deepart.io, you can actually create your own. Um, but look at what it's done. The computers even recognize things like that there's a kind of a flow of a line here between her, her eyebrow and her face and the shoulder. It's taken her hair bun and kind of converted it into a background. Uh, this guy's face has been kind of turned into this uh, you know, fascinating kind of geometric style and matched the background. Um, clearly, uh, these computer algorithms are doing something which is really nuanced and thoughtful and, dare I say, creative. Um, how is that happening? Um, there's me. Um, well, those of you that were here last year might have a guess. Uh, those of you who weren't, I'm going to give you last year's talk in four minutes. Uh, last year, I told you that uh, back in the old days, companies like Google used humans to tell you what to find on the internet. And uh, they got beaten by Google because Google replaced all of those computers, sorry, all of those humans with a computer algorithm using something called machine learning. I told you that machine learning goes back all the way to 1954. In 1954, this guy actually invented the idea of if you don't know how to 
program a computer to do something, see if it can figure it out for itself, and got this computer to learn how to beat him at checkers by playing against itself thousands of times. Um, machine learning has gone on to <clears throat> be a part of all of our lives today. Uh, Amazon's recommendation systems, uh, LinkedIn's people you may know, uh, or uh, Watson, uh, Watson's Jeopardy winning computer, uh, all are based on this idea of machine learning, um, algorithms that can learn from examples uh, rather than have to be programmed by hand. Um, I told you last year, if you were here, about how that's being used in medicine, um, for example, to create the field of radiomics, which combines radiology, uh, where CT scans of lungs, in this case, were um, analysed and um, human experts came up with lots of features which were expected to be useful for determining the prognosis for these uh, tumours. It was combined with gene expression data and using machine learning, they came up with an algorithm that discovered hundreds of clinically new relevant features uh, to help us um, diagnose and uh, um, estimate the prognosis for, uh, for lung cancer in CT scans. Uh, I also showed you the same thing being done in pathology, um, <clears throat> work that came out of, I think at that stage it was Stanford, the Andy Beck, his name is now at Harvard, uh, looking at a similar thing, coming up with lots and lots of ideas for features, combined using machine learning to come up with an algorithm that is um, more accurate than human pathologists at uh, predicting uh, prognosis or survivability um, based on pathology slides. Then I told you that something <clears throat> really uh, interesting had very recently happened, which is the world of machine learning, which has already been uh, incredibly powerful uh, and impacts all of us, uh, had just changed, uh, which is a new type of machine learning had come along, something called deep learning. And uh, Neil mentioned this to you briefly just now. Uh, I showed you how this new area of deep learning was allowing computers to do things that they could never do before. Um, because it was, rather than having to have human experts figure out the features that they wanted to compute and having people program them, in fact, deep learning creates features automatically. These are actual examples of features that are created from a face detector. Um, this, for example, allowed us to uh, create something which, uh, this is a demonstration uh, of what now is the Skype translator. Two years ago, it was just a research project, a deep learning research project that I showed last year. Um, I also showed that it achieved superhuman performance at recognizing images such as German traffic signs, um, and that the performance of this deep learning algorithm was getting better and better and better. Uh, it was also being used now for pathology, um, it was, you could now outper, outperform human pathologists without doing any of that manual uh, programming, uh, automatically using deep learning, uh, even things like neuron segmentation. So deep learning, when I was here last year, was just starting to appear in academic research in certain areas of medicine. It was just starting to appear in certain areas of academic research for things like translation. Um, as I've shown you, um, since that time, since I was here last year, um, we, all those exponentials happened. We now have Google Auto Reply. We now have Skype Automatic Translate. We now have uh, the um, um, automatic uh, art generators that you will do it for free on the, on the internet, any style you like. Uh, and furthermore, um, I last year said that <clears throat> I was gonna try and use this approach to um, see if we could use it in medicine to improve the accuracy and efficiency of medical diagnosis. And um, we've done that too. Uh, we built a company called Enlytic. This is what it looked like last year when I had just founded the company when I was here last. Uh, uh, I showed that we had done some very early research of our own at that point. We had figured out how to recognize dogs. Uh, we had figured, figured out how to recognize different types of galaxies. Um, and I described how I hoped that this could fill in the gap for the four billion people in the world that don't have access to modern medical diagnostics. Uh, according to the World Economic Forum, it's going to take about 300 years to train enough medical experts to meet the needs of the developing worlds. Um, this particular 300 years uh, is based on uh, Nigeria, um, but the actual um, Statistic is pretty much the same for China, pretty much the same for Indonesia, pretty much the same for India, and so forth. So this is the hope. This, this was the hope as of a year ago, was perhaps these new research directions could actually help us to meet this gap. Um, I started this company called Enlytic, um, and um, 
if that four-minute version was too short for you, my exponential medicine talk eventually ended up becoming a talk on TED.com, so you can get the 18-minute version if you search for my name on TED.com and fill in the gaps. So, that brings us to what's happened in the last year. Um, other than in the world of deep learning, all these other things with Google Auto Reply and Skype Translate and so forth, what's happened to this medical idea? Um, well, um, we built it. Um, we started with a, um, a, a million patients worth of medical records and we built a deep neural network of the whole human body. Uh, and we have a system now which can do all of these things, um, ranging from uh, detect, estimating the malignancy of a tumour, uh, all the way through to um, figuring out what the probability of an intervention being successful might be, through to finding other patients who might be similar to your patient and telling you about what happened to them. Um, and it turns out that it worked. Uh, we tested this on an, uh, a publicly available transparent data set. Um, we will be publishing these results in peer-reviewed journals uh, as soon as we finish writing them up. Uh, the false negative rate for looking at lung CT scans and figuring out whether or not the, uh, a nodule is malignant. Uh, a panel of four of the world's best human radiologists had a false negative rate of 7%. We got it down to zero. Uh, they had a false positive rate of 66%. Uh, we got it down to 47%. So it works for uh, early detection of cancer. If you detect cancer early, your probability of survival is 10 times higher. Um, not only that, but we also showed that as well as estimating the malignancy of a nodule, we could also show um, uh, the radiologists or physicians examples of similar um, patients out of the million patients that we had looked at so that they can understand why it is that this particular um, estimation is being done. So they could actually see, oh, how is this similar to previous patients, what happened to those previous patients, and so forth. So really understanding what's going on, not just making black box predictions. Um, we also showed uh, similar results for um, extremity x-ray fracture detection. Um, any radiologist in the audience would know this is an incredibly hard thing to do. Um, it's a 4,000 by 4,000 x-ray and about a pixel x-ray. About three pixels is where the fracture is. Uh, in this particular case, it's this tiny little bump here. Uh, as you can see, um, our software automatically um, created this heat map uh, to show the radiologist um, whereabouts the fracture was. Uh, the accuracy of that model uh, far higher, again, than the accuracy of radiologists and many generations beyond um, any of the previous um, approaches to this, which previously this was just something that didn't clinically work. Computers couldn't do this before the age of modern deep learning. So, um, very exciting for me. Some of you might have seen our news last week um, that uh, we just uh, raised another $10 million. So we've now raised $15 million to make this happen. Um, and most importantly, we're doing a big partnership with a company called Capital Radiology, which is the fastest growing radiology company in Australia, where they're going to roll this out across their entire network to make every one of their radiologists better than the world's best radiologist. Uh, and then from there, expand out across all of Asia. Uh, the CEO of um, Capital, John Kennedy, is actually here this week. So if you want to learn, learn more, uh, you can ask him or, uh, or ask me. It's a huge step. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it's the first time that any uh, really significant uh, medical enterprise is committed to transforming their, all of their diagnostic practices to leverage um, deep learning in this way. Uh, first time internationally. <coughs> so. Um, I guess a lot of what we do at Singularity University tends to be giving you a taste of maybe the future, or in this case, a little bit of a taste of even the present. Um, something that I like to do is to go a bit further and talk about um, how things work and why things work, um, to kind of demystify things a little bit. And uh, yesterday, or was it this morning? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, in a small number of hours ago, uh, Google... Um, uh, released something called TensorFlow, um, which is the first platform that's being released uh, under any kind of license, whether it be commercial, open source, anything. The first platform that's available to, to allow anybody to build these kinds of solutions end to end. Um, interestingly, you know, as I've started to look at some of the comments about TensorFlow today, the most common comment I see uh, from computer scientists uh, kind of on, on Reddit or Hacker News or whatever is, um, 
I have no idea what this is. Uh, the introduction is, it's an open source software library for numerical computation using data flow graphs. Nodes in the graphs represent mathematical operations, while the graph edges represent the tensors communicated between them. OK, clearly, this doesn't mean much to anybody who hasn't been working in deep learning for the last year or so. And yet, this might turn out to be as significant as the release of the programming language C. Uh, back in the you know, 60s or 70s. This is kind of the first time that something has been released that brings this new way of working with computers out to the world. Um, there have been research level kind of libraries before, but this is a complete system. And um, in the years to come, my guess is that um, that sentence will become the dominant way of working with computers or else the previous way is programming, which we all probably know as being you know, loops and conditionals and variables. And even if you're not a coder, you have the general sense that the old way of working with computers was tell them exactly what you want them to do every step of the way. Um, the results that I've shown you today have been built using a very, very different approach, which is one where we say to the computer, here are some examples of what I want you to achieve. Uh, Go figure it out. And the way that it goes, figures it out, is using this. Um, so it's actually worth trying to dig into this mysterious um, picture that they have to understand what the hell this is. Because my contention last year, when I was here, was that deep learning was about to change the world. Uh, I'm coming back here saying, I think you, it's, it's happening. You can actually see it's being released. Um, I'm now saying, as of today, it's now possible for everybody to start to do this themselves. So let's try and understand what the hell is actually going on. What is this mysterious picture? Um, and this is why I needed my computer, because I have to draw. Um, I have some bad news for those of you who weren't that fond of math, um, and that is that the word gradients appears here. Um, and that is actually uh, basically what this new type of programming is about. It's all about calculus. Sorry to say it. The good news is, for those of you who remember calculus, might remember that the really um, annoying bit was integration, and the kind of OK bit was differentiation. You only have to do differentiation. OK, so um, that's the good news. So why is this basically all about calculus, and why should you um, care? Well, the reason why is that basically when you create a deep learning algorithm, what you basically do is you say, I have some result that I want to create. Um, that result might be as simple as kind of a 1 or a 0, which is, did this CT scan turn out to, have, uh, turn out to be a malignant tumor or not? Uh, and then you have some input, um, and a CT scan is a three-dimensional thing. You know, generally, it's about 512 by about 512 by about 250 um, voxels, 3D pixels. And somehow, you want to take this huge bunch of information and turn it into a 1 or a 0. Um, so in the bad old days, when we had to program things by hand, you had to have lots and lots of domain specialists come up with all kinds of ideas about, oh, what kinds of things might make a tumor, you know, a nodule malignant. And they'd come up with things about like, oh, the shape of it could be kind of spiky, or the texture of it could be kind of varied, or the size of it could be a bit bigger. And then the programmers would go away, and literally it would be a whole PhD to come up with one feature and program it and test it out. And so kind of medical computing has proceeded at a glacial pace. Uh, and certainly um, everybody who's worked with uh, kind of computer decision support systems or computer-aided detection knows how annoying it's been because they, they just don't work, basically. Um, with, with deep learning, actually all we have to do is say, there's some kind of equation in the middle, uh, and you basically come up with an equation that's so flexible that it could do absolutely everything. Um, so the types of equations that people generally use are things called neural networks. Um, I know that a lot of you will be familiar with those from the early 90s when there were some um, unsuccessful attempts to use uh, simple versions of neural networks. Um, what's happened since that time is we've created much, much bigger ones, as in the ones that we use at Analytic will have 600 million um, neurons or more, um, so potentially billions of connections. 
Um, these functions are able to basically calculate anything that you can conceive of, as long as you get these 600 million numbers co correct. Um, so how do you get those 600 million numbers correct? Well, what you do is you start out with them random, you bring your CT scan in, uh, you run it through your basically random neural network, and it comes out randomly with either a 1 or a 0. And if it's wrong, you have to go back and change those 600 million numbers so that, they're, so that it wouldn't be wrong next time. How do you do that? Those of you that remember calculus, that's what the derivative is. The derivative is the thing that says, how would you change this to get this outcome? So basically, the thing which was just released um, is something which can take these, uh, this thing here is basically a representation of that uh, huge function in the middle. And what this is showing is the CT scan coming in, going through this huge function, and at the end, figuring out the derivative of that entire function with respect to all of those 600 million things. And once it knows the derivative, here it says update, it can go back and update those 600 million numbers to make them a little bit better. So it's kind of like amazing. You, you, you have something which we did at high school, you know, where we maybe change two parameters in a function, and it turns out that when you do it with 600 million parameters, you can, we know, translate language. Um, uh, do diagnoses from CT scans. Um, um, you know, all the kinds of things that we've talked about today come out of this. And perhaps this should not be surprising, because actually it turns out that recent neuroscience research has shown that this particular um, approach of basically calculus uh, in the neural network literature, this is called um, backprop, backpropagation or backprop, um, it turns out that the human brain basically does that. So the neural network was originally built to be a simple replica of the human brain. Uh, backprop was not, but we now know from very recent research that it turns out actually reflects something that we now know the human brain to do. And so we now know that this actually very simple process, scaled up very large, gives results that look a lot like the human brain. So for example, the latest deep learning algorithms can recognize images in pictures more accurately than humans can. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the, um, um, that's the, the message here for me is that the sky is the limit. So for us, we decided a year ago to build a deep learning system for medicine and to try to use it to see if we can use this approach to connect um, medical data of all kinds, genomics, radiology, pathology, and so forth, to outcomes. Uh, and indeed to interventions, and it's going extremely well so far. Um, my belief is that this is going to impact as many things as the internet impacted back in the 90s. You know, if you were around back in the 90s, you would have been thinking, oh yeah, you know, this internet thing, it seems everywhere I look, it could change what's done. Um, deep learning is going to be the same. So uh, now is a great time for you to be starting to take an interest in learning this, and um, perhaps it'll uh, you know, impact your, um, your research or your work as well. Um, love to answer questions over the next few days. Come and chat to me anytime. Thanks so much.